Oh, what a mess. This is Neil Schneider from Meant to Be Seen. Welcome back to my messy basement. So, as you know, the past few episodes, I've been on a personal mission to enable the personal computer, the PC, to be the ultimate home entertainment device. I, when I'm talking about home entertainment, I'm talking about video games. I'm talking about movies. I'm talking about streaming. I want my PC to be responsible for everything. More than this, uh, I'm very pleased with my Panasonic AE7000 3D uh, 1080p projector. I've had it for years. I've been really happy with it. Uh, I don't feel very motivated to upgrade the projector uh, anytime soon. And I really want all my content experiences to run on it just fine. That's really what I want. I mean, I've been very happy with it. I see no, no cause to, to change it uh, just yet. Uh, more than this, though, I'm a huge fan. Well, I shouldn't say more than this, but in, you know, <laughs> almost at the same level, if you will. Uh, I'm a huge fan of surround sound, in particular Dolby Atmos and DTS-X. And I want all my content, uh, you know, as much Dolby Atmos and DTSX content is available, I want it running uh, on my uh, setup. And uh, last but not least, uh, I'd really like to be able to enable all these experiences and save some money uh, in the process. So what I've done over the past uh, several episodes of Neil's Messy Basement is I've talked about different uh, you know, scenarios and, and how to enable, uh, you know, my display and how to enable surround sound and do all these wonderful things uh, and get the most out of our uh, entertainment experiences. So this is the plan for today. I've got a, a doozy episode for you today. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about Blu-ray. All right. Blu-ray is a, a really big deal because it's the highest quality uh, home entertainment available for consumers, okay? But before we could touch on Blu-ray, Blu before we could even touch on it, we have to have an understanding of uh, why Ultra HD 4K displays are so different from, the ten from standard 1080p displays or full HD displays, which is what my, you know, my proud cinema projector uh, is based on. And why is this important? Because there is a growing divide uh, for compatibility of Dolby Atmos and DTSX surround sound with these uh, display uh, formats. And um, so this is so and finally, only after only after we have an understanding of the differences between 4K and 1080p, can we appreciate what's involved to really get that ultimate Blu-ray experience running on the PC? So we have a lot to cover today, and I'm just going to blow your mind. I'm just going to blow your mind by saying something straight out. When it comes to Blu-ray and it comes to the PC, the PC is by far, by far, the worst platform for Blu-ray. Okay, but at the same time, it's the best. Okay, so I'm going to say that again. By far, by far, PC is the worst platform for Blu-ray. But at the same time, it's the absolute best. And by the time this episode is done, okay, you're going to have an understanding as to how to get the best Blu-ray experience on your PC. So we'll be back with more right after this. So before we continue, I'd like to give you a very quick primer on our on the displays that we use. So when we're talking about displays, we're talking about HDTVs, we're talking about projectors. And there's two, uh, we'll say, two major classifications of, this, of display right now. So the first is 1080p Full HD displays. They're still they're still very popular. Uh, it's 1920 pixels across, 1080 pixels vertical. And more often than not, and when I say more often, I mean almost always, 
they are based on 8-bit color depth. Okay, so the 8-bit color depth, that refers to the, the color space and how many colors the display could put on screen at a time. So um, the, the, uh, the color space that Full HD 1080p displays live in is called standard dynamic range. Okay? So this is, uh, this is also known as BT709. Okay? Now, if we move up to 4K, Okay, so 4K Ultra HD displays, uh, things dramatically change in more ways than one. First, we got a lot more resolution. So when we're talking about 4K, we're talking about 300,840 pixels across and 2,160 pixels uh, vertical. So 3840 by 2160 pixels. The color depth is significantly higher. So whereas before our 1080 displays were 8-bit color depth, in the case of, uh, of uh, 4K displays, they are usually at least 10 bits of color. They can be as high as 12 bits of color um, if we use technologies like uh, uh, Dolby Vision. Um, another way that this is framed is usually the, the color space is, is part of the full spec, which we call HDR, or High Dynamic Range. Okay? So the thing about High Dynamic Range, or HDR, is it's not just about having a wider uh, color gamut. The, the displays are also a lot brighter. So if you can imagine uh, like a, an SDR or a 1080 display used to have a requirement of just 100 nits. So a nit is a, a measurement of brightness, of, of brightness coming out of a, that we see on a display screen. Uh, 100 nits for an SDR display or a 1080 display. Right now, content is authored okay, for 4K HDR, if you'd believe, a thousand nits, right? A thousand nits of brightness. So there's a lot more brightness expected, note the words expected, of an HDR uh, display. Another advantage of HDR is in addition to being a lot brighter than what, a, what, a, what our earlier displays uh, were capable of, there's also a lot more variation between the deep black and the pristine white. Okay, so uh, if you recall in an earlier episode, we talked about calibrating a display and trying to get the most steps between our extreme black and pristine white. Well, when dealing with an HDR display, there's a lot more variation between the two, which is really good for seeing fine details in the shadows and for our colors to look more pristine and to see more uh, um, variations in skin tones. All kinds of amazing things can be visualized with really good uh, HDR. Another point about uh, HDR is that there's metadata. Okay? There's extra data stored in HDR feeds. And this data tells the display not just what the image is, but it gives it extra information so that it is more likely to look good on that specific display. Okay, so that's very important. That's additional data that we don't have with earlier uh, display formats. Now, a challenge with HDR, I mean, it's, I mean, it sounds fantastic. It's got all this extra brightness, all this extra contrast, all kinds of, you know, you know color, extra colors, all kinds of wonderful stuff. The challenge is that uh, at the receiving end, uh, even though a display can be listed as being HDR compliant, there are variations of capabilities from one display to the next. So even though content, for example, could be authored to, for a display that delivers a thousand nits of brightness, which is a lot of brightness, in practice, there could be variations of anywhere from a, just 100 nits to over 1,000 nits of brightness. Okay, So that's a lot of variation from one solution to the next. Another challenge is that even though the content may be authored based on BT2020, which is the color space, the display may not be able to actually show every one of those uh, colors. Okay, they might be able to show like a, a large percentage 
of that color space, but not necessarily all of it. So what this means is that when, when HDR content is distributed, it could look different depending on the solution that you're, you're running it on. And that is, you know, that could be a challenge in itself. Fortunately, fortunately, there is a solution. And the solution is called tone mapping. And what tone mapping is, it's a live process. It happens on the fly. And what it does is it adjusts the, the, the image's tonal values to look good for the, for the display that it's running on. So I'll give you an example. If I have a, a 4K HDTV, and let's say I have maybe 200 nits of brightness, but the content is authored for 1,000 nits, much, much brighter. What the tone mapping will do is it will adjust the nature of the content that when it appears on my display, it will look good according to the capabilities of my display. So this is, this is a very important feature that uh, displays have and that processors have because it makes a very big difference in the quality that we experience from our HDTVs uh, and our projectors. The ch one of the challenges though is uh, not all tone mapping solutions are born equal. It can be processor intensive and uh, there can be uh, you know, differences in the results. Okay, so there, you know, as I said, not everything uh, is born equal. Now, we've talked about the formats. Let's talk about the actual uh, display technologies themselves. When it comes to HDR, HDTV displays like OLED especially and LCD, they have really big advantages. In particular, they're very bright. Okay, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a lot, it, it, compared to a projector, it's a lot easier to get a, a bright enough Im, image from the display that it is considered HDR compliant, okay? Uh, another thing is that when it comes to showing contrast between the extreme black and pristine white, it's easier to show all the different variations from black to white on an HDTV than it is uh, you know, through, through projection. And another big advantage is when it comes to a black level, that deep, deep black level, on an HDTV, you know, it's as simple as turning the pixel off. Like with an OLED, you know, system, there's actually no light coming out of the display at all, just because it's unpowered. So black is like, a, you know, a, a, a screen without any power going to it, which is really, the, I imagine, the darkest that black uh, can be. Uh, LCD has a similar advantage where it can do location-based dimming on the screen. So it's really, you know, they have inherent advantages. In contrast, okay, with a projector, if you have an HDR-capable uh, projector, there's st they, they, it still has uh, some big challenges. First, the black level is much harder to achieve on a projector than it is on an uh, on an HDTV. Why? Because you can't project black. <laughs> I mean, be, you know, think about it. You can't, how do you project black? Uh, what a projector has to do, if anything, is block light, okay? So it's shining this, like, this big beam of light again on the screen, and it has to find a way that it's selective, that not all the light hits the screen. So it has to somehow block that light. So the most you can expect out of a projector is a really, really, really dark gray, okay? Uh, it will look great, by the way. I mean, you're going to get a good image out of a projector, but just know that it, it is much harder for a, a projector to achieve deep blacks when compared uh, to an HDTV. Uh, another factor is, as I mentioned, uh, HDTVs have a much easier time reaching those uh, higher uh, nit levels, those higher brightness levels that's needed to be comp compatible with HDR for HDR to deliver the optimal result. Uh, a projector usually is limited to maybe 100 nits of brightness, you know, once it's on the screen. 
may, maybe 150. It's, it's, uh, it's unusual to be much brighter than that based on what I've read, okay? So that in itself is a challenge uh, for projectors when it comes to uh, HDR. Now, I'm at a disadvantage because I personally don't own uh, an HDR uh, projector, okay? Um, I'd love to get some testing done so I can run a comparable. I know, I know that there's more guides to be done based on that, okay? But uh, what I did was I, I did the next best thing. I was curious that if a projector is limited in brightness to maybe 100, 150 nits compared to HGTVs, which could do much, much more, uh, is, are we, is HDR content actually looking better on a projector versus SDR content or, the type, or 1080 content with the SDR color space? So what I did was there are really popular forms called AVS, they're called the AVS forms, very popular among home theater enthusiasts. And I ran a straw poll, okay? And I just, I posed the question like this. I asked, when I watch content on my HDR compatible projector, uh, and then you, they have three choices. HDR content looks better, SDR content looks better, or they are, they're about the same. Okay, so it's just a multiple choice question and I was curious to see how the projector owners would answer. Now keep in mind, uh, the sample size was pretty small, it was like 34 respondents, but they also had commentary on top of this, which I thought was really, really helpful. So this is what I learned based on this limited sample. 65% of them said that uh, HDR looked better on their projector than SDR. So that sounds really good. 12%, uh, 12% okay, of them said that the SDR content looked better on their projector than HDR content. Okay, so that means that the older school content looked better than the, than the newer stuff. Uh, and then 23% said that the the uh, HDR and the SDR content looked about the same. So that, you know, that, that really struck me that over a third of the projector owners that have projectors listed as being uh, HDR uh, compatible uh, were saying that either the SDR was a bit better than the HDR or that they were about the same, okay? So um, there was commentary. There was commentary attached to this. Uh, based on the commentary, this is what I got out of it. First, uh, four, even though 4K projectors can play HDR content, they aren't really HDR compliant. They aren't really showing HDR content the way it was uh, authored to be shown, okay? Um, the, the projectors are heavily, heavily dependent on tone mapping to get their results. Now, by the way, I want to underscore, the people that were sharing in the forums were happy with the results. They were happy with what they were getting out of their projectors. But they were, you know, they highlighted that a lot of tone mapping was necessary, uh, you know, to get those, those visual results. The most of the innovation, from what I saw, uh, wasn't to do so much with HDR as far as like having more brightness and more levels of contrast from deep black to pristine white. Uh, from what I gathered in that discussion, most of the innovation was more to do with color gamut, was it being able to show more colors uh, from that BT2020 color space than is available in the old uh, BT709 or SDR color space. So that was interesting. Uh, another point, and I, there's no way to prove this, okay, there's no, well, maybe there is if I have the right equipment, but, but right now there's no way to prove it. It was suggested that content on an HDR projector, the HDR content on a, on a projector may look better, not because of technological reasons that the, that the projector is that much better, it may have more to do that the content was authored better, that the artistic work that went into the 
HDR version was higher than the work that went into the 1080p SDR version. Okay, so granted, yeah, I mean, there might be a wider color gamut and so on available for projectors in HDR, but maybe it was the, the, the production itself that made for a better uh, outcome. There's no way to prove this, okay? It's just something that was, you know, suggested uh, in the discussion. Now, granted, uh, what I saw, for the most part, everyone was happy with their, their solution, but what I also consistently saw was people wanted better tone mapping solutions. They wanted additional tone mapping beyond what their projector uh, was built with. So this is, I, I'm sharing this with you because it left me with two, two important questions, okay? So the first question is when we're talking about projection, okay? So we're talking about projection. Is there an opportunity to close the gap, okay? To close the gap between SDR projectors and HDR projectors. I mean, granted, I mean, the, of course, HDR projectors, 4K projectors, they can do more, They're, you know, they have, Obviously, there's things they can do that older generation projection can't do. But all the same, can that gap be closed? Okay. And then the second question was, can, can the image quality of 4K HDR uh, displays and projectors be even better, be even better than uh, what comes out of the box? Okay. Are, is there an additional opportunity, you know, to enhance the video, to enhance the image quality beyond, uh, you know, what gets delivered to your doorstep, you know, with the default uh, setup? Well, we're going to start. Let's let's explore the answers a bit. Let's see what we can do. So I'd like to talk about. Blu-ray. All right, so these are, oh, this is an empty box. Ha, <laughs> that doesn't help me. Here we go. Blu-ray. Woohoo! So, why is Blu-ray so appealing? Well, Blu-ray, by far, in my opinion, and frankly, it's probably a fact, is the best image and audio quality you can get. Okay, it's, it's, it, 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 I, I suspect it's much better than what you would get through streaming. It's high bit, the whole thing, Blu-ray, Blu-ray, Blu-ray. Now, there are two flavors of Blu-ray. Uh, the first is normal Blu-ray, okay? It supports 1920 by 1080 pixels, so, uh, and it's the 8-bit SDR color space of BT709. So this is for full HD, 1080p displays and projectors. It can support Dolby Atmos and DTSX surround sound. I say it can. Okay, it can. Um, and it will run on most uh, platforms without difficulty. Okay. If we move up to the latest generation of Blu-ray, we have what's called 4K Ultra HD or UHD Blu-ray. So this supports full resolution 3840 by 2160 pixels. So that's 4K resolution. It usually supports Dolby Atmos and DTSX. So if you get a modern Blu-ray, you'll get, you'll usually get a choice of the latest generation of uh, surround sound mixes. It, it supports uh, HDR technologies. And in my experience, it's actually much more stringent as far as which players you can use, uh, which players and platforms it will work with. Another benefit, by the way, when you buy a 4K uh, Blu-ray, you don't. You, not only do you get the 4K version, but you get the the 1080p version of the Blu-ray as well. So you you actually get, in addition to the quality of the content itself, you get an additional version of that content included. So that that's a plus. Um, there are challenges though with Blu-ray. Uh, first, you know, if you were to get uh, you know, the 1080p version of the Blu-ray and the Ultra version of the Blu-ray, what you likely find is the Dolby Atmos or the DTSX mix of that content is only available on the 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray, okay? 
Uh, another thing is, all right, well, fine. So let's say you have the Ultra HD Blu-ray. Put it into your system. You play it. You have a 1080 display. I, fortunately, it's going to look ugly. Okay, everything's you know everything's going to be what you know whitewashed and or washed out. I should say, it's just it's not going to be pretty. It'll sound great. It's going to sound fantastic, but it's going to look terrible. Um, and uh, and as I said, with Ultra HD, it's somewhat stringent as to what you could uh, play it back on. So this is a in my opinion, this is a big problem because here I am, it's a problem for me, right? Here I am, I've got a wonderful surround sound system I'm really happy with. I've got a projector that I'm really happy with, but uh, I, I can't get those surround sound mixes unless I'm playing the 4K, you, you know, the 4K Ultra HD uh, Blu-ray with HDR, which, you know, the, it looks really ugly on my projector. So that's the problem and I'm not alone in this. So, so, let's talk about Blu-ray on PC. Well, what can I tell you? It really, really sucks. <laughs> That's all I can say. Blu-ray on PC really, really sucks. Uh, and let me tell you why. Uh, first, it, it has to do with, uh, mainly it has to do with compatibility. There were only, what is required to play an Ultra HD 4K Blu-ray on PC is it needs a C, this PC has to have a CPU with a certain architecture which deems it compatible with uh, ultra, 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray. If the CPU does not have this architecture, it won't play. Doesn't matter what player you have, <coughs> excuse me, it just won't play. So, uh, for Intel CPUs, there's a couple generations or a few generations of Intel CPU that have this architecture. But if you're too early, you don't have it. And my understanding, at least from what I read, later versions of, of Intel CPUs are not including this architecture altogether. Now, for AMD CPUs, like Ryzen, for example, uh, I contacted AMD, I did not hear back. Based on what I read, though, they also do not have this architecture built in. So if you have a 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray that you want to play on your PC, so sorry, okay? Uh, it sucks. It's not going to work out for you until today. Um, okay, so uh, other thing. If you happen to have uh, the right architecture in your PC, Unfortunately, there's only a limited number of players that support it. And I know for myself, uh, I did have to do some tweaking to figure a way around it, even with what I'm currently running. And I got to tell you, it was a tweaking nightmare. Okay, I had to download special DLL files. I had to do, like, I just, I don't wish it on you. Okay, and we won't be discussing that today. All right, so this is what we want. Okay, I, let's put that nightmare behind us, right? Let's get, let's get the, the PC Blu-ray out of this really, really sucks zone. Uh, we want, I, well, I should say I want, okay? I want to play 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray on my PC with any display. Okay, I want it running on, if I want it running on a 4K display with HDR, fantastic. If I want it playing on a 1080 projector as I have, fantastic. I want it to look good 100% of the time. Okay, I want it looking great. I don't want it looking washed out or weird or discolored. I just want it looking great. And then finally, uh, I want it to support my surround sound system. I want to hear those Dolby Atmos mixes and DTSX. I want the room to rumble and shake. That's what I want. And I want it running on my PC. So um, I'm going to walk you through the process as to how to achieve this right after this. Okay, we want to get our Ultra HD uh, 4K Blu-ray running on PC. So first thing, let me share with you what I'm actually running. Okay, so it's just, I think it's a mid-level gaming PC. It's the motherboard is a Gigabyte Z170 XP SLI motherboard. There's nothing really that, uh, uh, special about the motherboard for this purpose. 
The CPU is an Intel Core i7 6700K, uh, four gigahertz CPU. So just a heads up, this CPU is a generation that does not support 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray. I learned that the hard way. Um, the graphics card is an EVGA GTX 2080. So that's a higher end, for sure it's a higher end uh, a graphics, graphics card. However, I also tested with an AMD R9 390X graphics card as well. So this, what I'm sharing with you will work with that as well. And that's, I would describe that as in today's day and age, a lower end uh, a gra graphics card. Uh, as far as the Blu-ray player is concerned, I'm using an LG WH16N, S, excuse me, NS60 uh, Ultra HD Blu-ray player. So I'll repeat that. LG WH16NS60 Ultra HD Blu-ray player, and it's, it's a writer as well. And finally, I keep repeating, I'm running a, a Panasonic AE7000 uh, 1080p projector, which is a, a standard dynamic range, or SDR. Now, the first thing we need to do is we need to import the, the 4K Ultra HD uh, Blu-ray into the PC and, and so that they, they are files that the PC will understand. So what you need to do is you need to download and install software called Make MKV. Okay, so it's called Make MKV. It's free to download and use. Okay, they have they have new ver they regularly come out with new versions. Check it out. It's, it's well worth it. What the software does is it imports full Blu-rays and and Ultra HD Blu-rays and uh, DVDs uh, into media files that most PC media players will be able to understand and to play. Okay, very convenient. More than this, it retains all the media benefits. So if it's 4K Ultra HD with HDR, you're gonna get HDR. It's going to include the Dolby Atmos and DTS-X surround sound mixes. Um, it's going it, it, like to, pretty much all the benefits that are, are, are built into the original Blu-ray will be imported into your PC. Now, as far as drive compatibility, uh, make sure that if you have not purchased a, a, a 4K Blu-ray drive yet, okay, when you're shopping for one, make sure that it is listed as supporting Ultra HD uh, 4K Blu-ray. Uh, there is such a thing as a, uh, my understanding is there is such a thing as a 4K Blu-ray without this functionality. So be careful, okay? Make, make a note, make a point to, to get a, a, a 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray drive for your PC. Something to be aware of as well. Uh, before you buy your drive, do your research on Make MKV, okay? Uh, because uh, they do have a list of drives that work. Uh, you'll have to go through your, their discussion forums. Just make sure that the model you want to buy is, is most likely to work with their software. It would, I really don't wish it on you that you buy a, a piece of hardware that does not work with the software, okay? So just do some research before you, you finalize your, your purchase. Now, something to think about, okay? Uh, this is something that you can pursue at your, at your own risk, but just to be aware of it. Uh, many Blu-ray drives or 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray drives are known as Libre drives, L-I-B-R-E drive, okay? Libre drive refers to a mode that the drive can go in where it reads disks strictly as ones and zeros, just binary, ones and zeros. What it sees, it gets, and it, it captures, okay? Um, Many, many drives have this feature available to them. Sometimes that feature uh, gets turned off in a later 
firmware uh, update to the drive. Do your research. Some drives can get a firmware update where it, where it gets reverted to an earlier version of the drive's uh, firmware so that it, it can support that Libra drive format. The reason why Libra drive is helpful is because it's only reading zeros and ones. It doesn't care. Now, uh, I have to underscore, though, that if this is something that you want to do or you choose to do, it's very possible that you could void your warranty by doing this, okay? And it may be completely unnecessary. It may be possible that your, your Blu-ray drive works out of the box without having to do any firmware updates. So please research uh, if it's you know, necessary at all. Uh, from what I've read, okay, uh, it, it does make things a lot more convenient because once it's set, it's set and you're good to go for life. And, uh, and, uh, but just, just to be aware of it. Now, so let's, let's actually go through the process here. So uh, let me, I'm going to open up the software. Okay, I'm running the software. I have a Blu-ray, a 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray in my PC right now. So what I needed to do, so let's see. So it's got, it's got it text my drive. It tells me a little bit about my, my, uh, my Blu-ray player. So I click this big icon here. And what it's doing is it's doing a quick analysis of the disk. Analyzing, analyzing. There we go. Okay. So what it does is it gives me a breakdown of what's on the drive. And it's possible that on that single disk, it could have different versions of the same movie where it could have like in different languages. It might have different audio mixes. So just to keep it as simple as possible, we're going to ask it to import everything. So I choose where I, I want this uh, stored. So I have a special, I, I have my own personal uh, cloud space locally. It's not a remote cloud, it's a local cloud. And um, da da da. All right, so I'm just going to put it here. So I'm going to select here. So I'm going to select here. I'm selecting the folder. And then and I'm just going to get it started. And here we go. So what it's doing is it's reading the Blu-ray, it's importing the content into something my PC will understand. And uh, now the process, it depends on your hardware, how fast the player is, how fast access to the hard drives is. For me, it could take 45 minutes to an hour for a full uh, Blu-ray. For you, it could take less time because maybe you're not doing it through, through a local cloud. You know, like there's all kinds of things that can, can uh, uh, address it, but just be prepared. It's, you know, get it started, walk away for a while. And when you get back, you'll have all your uh, Blu-ray files uh, imported into your uh, PC. So we'll end this, okay? And let's move on uh, to the next phase. So the next step is you need to get your hands on software called MAD VR, M A D V R. And it's free, it is free, okay? It's video rendering software. And it works with a with I'd say well we'll say a few players. Okay, there are a few media players out there that support it. Some are specialized. That's why I'm I was a little hesitant. But we'll say well, it supports a few uh, media players. A few media players work with it. Now, what is it? What is MadVR? Well, what MadVR is, is it, 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 it actually tone maps content. Okay? You, you, with the power of your, your PC, with your, with your graphics card, it, among other things, it will take HDR content and tone map it into something that, that looks good on a, on a 1080p SDR display or projector, okay? And the way it does this is, it granted, there's fewer colors on an SDR display, 
I mean, there's, it's 8-bit uh, color depth compared to 10-bit color depth. So there's a, there's a big difference. So what it does is, with the power of your, of your graphics card, is it uses a technique called dithering, where it simulates different shades of color with patterns of pixels. Okay, patterns of pixels and different types of colors. It's a bit of an illusion. So you get an emulated HDR result, which looks really, really good. Um, so uh, another benefit for MadVR is if you have uh, a 4K HDR display, like an HDTV, and it, it has less than 1,000 nits of brightness. So remember, content is authored usually for 1,000 nits of brightness. What if you have a display or a projector that, even though it's listed as HDR compatible, doesn't, uh, isn't quite as bright as what the content is authored for? MadVR can step in and get things well scaled that, in theory, it could look better than what your projector or your display can do on their own. So that's really, that's really exciting. Now, other, other benefits that it delivers it does debanding, it does sharpening, it does scaling, okay, so that you can take things smaller and, and make them look bigger. It does all kinds of really, really neat stuff. And uh, the, the catch is it can be processor intensive, okay, so it does put a lot of extra work on your, in particular, on your graphics card. Uh, but the, the more your card is capable of, the more Mad VR can do. So it's really, it's, it's a really good uh, piece of software. So I'll just show you really quickly how to uh, install it. Okay, so I'm going to go into my Mad VR directory. Here we go. All you really need to do is uncompress it, put it into a specific, you know, any directory that you choose. There's an install file. Okay, and what and what you do is you run that that install file as an administrator. So you run as administrator. Yeah. Installation succeeded. Okay, great. So we've got we've got Mad VR installed. And you should see this logo at the bottom. Sometimes that logo only appears when you're running a movie. It depends on your on your settings. Okay. In my case, I have it set up that it's always there. So what you do is you choose edit Mad VR settings. And I'm just going to go from top to bottom here. M much of it isn't very important. So this, this first setting under devices, I have my projector, OK? It's listed as a digital projector. Then under, I could expand this setting further. OK, I have some information about my projector. Uh, keep in mind, I have mine going through a scaler and stuff. You won't necessarily be doing this, OK? But, but all the same. Uh, it's, the native bit depth I have listed at 8-bit because that's what my display is capable of. Let's take a look see here. For calibration, uh, what I recommend if you're using a 1080 SDR display as I am, just say the display is already calibrated. Choose BT709 because that's the color space that this display is capable of. And choose Pure Power Curve 2.2. See, uh, I'm looking to see if there's other stuff that could be important here. Okay, uh, display modes. For me, at least, it wasn't very important. Uh, color and gamma, not very important. HDR, this is very important. Okay, so over here, don't choose let Mad VR de decide. I recommend just going straight for tone map HDR using pixel shaders. Okay, for display peak luminance, I have mine set for 100 nits. The reason that is is because it's an SDR display, and SDR displays are, are capable of 100 nits. Uh, it, it's not like my display, I don't think, is capable of going higher than that. If you, ha if you did have a capable display, you would adjust uh, accordingly. Now, these, these settings over here, color tweaks for fire and explosions, highlight recovery, contrast recovery, shadow recovery, these are methods, or these are features that MadVR does, where it takes HDR content and it it uh, emulates it for your SDR, or it makes it look better on your uh, HDR display according to its capabilities. 
The problem with these settings, I wouldn't call it a problem, but just to be aware of it, is they can be processor uh, intensive. So you may have to reduce some of these settings if your movie is chunky or you know it just it, it, your your computer's having difficulty keeping up. I'm a lucky guy though because I have an uh, an EVGA GTX 2080 in this system, uh, so I'm able to I've been able to maximize all these uh, settings without uh, difficulty. As for the other settings, uh, I don't really see anything uh, to change here, though you may discover. Uh, new things on your own. Uh, as for the rest, I'm just doing a quick check here, see if I missed anything special. You know, like I would encourage actually if you, you know, on your own to do your own research because there's all kinds of guides out there with their own uh, recommendations that you can adjust according to taste. Uh, so for, for me, uh, like for chroma upscaling, I use, I like to use Jink because it like you'll see here, it lists trade-offs with different options. So I try to minimize, uh, you know, the trade-off. Sometimes with these emulation techniques, there could be some like noise in, in the image, you know, like noise would be like pixelations and artifacts. So, so there are different methods that, uh, you know, you don't see it as much, but there could be performance trade-offs. So just things to be aware of, things to experiment with that's right for your particular equipment. And I'm just going to highlight, um, there's this final area here, which is important, trade quality for performance. These are all things that you can adjust that will, you know, get the movie or get, get, get whatever, you're whatever you are playing to perform a bit better, uh, but there could be some minor trade-offs on, on the visual. So you're going to have to go according to taste, okay? But there are, you know, but these are things that you can... Um, can work with. But other than that, for most part, everything's at default settings as, as you know, as far as, as I'm uh, concerned. So the next step, this is a very important step, is to install and configure Pot Player. So why Pot Player? Okay, well, first off, it's free. That's a really good excuse right there. Um, I really like the player because it's got all kinds of tweaking options and all kinds of adjustments that you can make to make the, the whatever you're watching look even better. Uh, it supports Mad VR. It has direct support for the Mad uh, VR video renderer, and it actually supports other renderers as well, which is really good. And you know something that was very obvious for me is it supports Dolby Atmos and DTSX pass through, so that it could take the, those audio channels and send them direct to my surround sound system so I hear all the uh, audio benefits. And as far as visually, um, I, I think that it actually looks better, stuff looks better on Pot Player uh, than what I've seen with other players. So that's, that's a benefit right there. And as I said, it, it, it's free software. Um, so let me, uh, let me show you how to get this thing uh, set up. So first, we're going to go into preferences. All right. So under, uh, okay. So let's take a look here. So the first thing you need to do in preferences under filter control, we go to open codec. Open codec is is something that you get downloaded with Pot Player, and I recommend installing it along with the Pot Player installation. It's part of the same process. You can't miss it. Now, if you have an NVIDIA uh, graphics card, okay, this actually was set up for me by default, okay, you should have the NVIDIA CUDA and NVENC features uh, enabled, okay? So uh, right now it says enable, show selection if the system supports it. So that's fine. Have that enabled. If you have an, an AMD graphics card, then uh, what you would do is you'd have AMD AMF encoder enabled. Okay, it's, it's my understanding it's, it's the equivalent to, to what uh, NVIDIA is doing. So it depends on your card. If you have, um, uh, another thing, if you're using an AMD graphics card, okay, before you run Pot Player, 
you should also install and run the lav lav filters it's a separate installation you do it's just an extra step that you need to do for amd graphics cards other than that everything i'm sharing here is is uh very much the same so so we're fine so it looks like my my uh video is set up okay take a look see here if there's anything special i'm looking at video decoder so then we choose built-in video codec uh DXVA settings. Let's see if there's anything special here. Okay, so at the top right under uh, built-in video decoder configuration, you want to choose use DXVA, and it's uh, this is already selected here, or sort of selected here. Prioritize Direct 3D DX 11 DXVA. Get that selected. Everything else, you should be uh, good to go. So that's fine. Audio decoder. All right, this is going to be very important. So you choose audio decoder. Then we go to uh, built-in audio codec pass-through settings. Okay, very important. So you'll see here it's checkmarked enable pass-through bit streaming. Okay, that's fine. Um, now, by default, okay, I had, it, I had mine set up here, which is good. But by default, it would normally have been on disabled, okay? So you need to make sure... Uh, yours is enabled like this. Default, 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 pass through, right through, okay? Choose okay. Okay, make sure your settings are saved, all right? So now the moment of truth. Okay, so we're gonna open a file. We're in the 4K, so this is the fully imported version of the Blu-ray I paid for. Okay, let's see if this works. So just double click. Oh, there's one more thing. I forgot something very important. So uh, we're going to choose the video renderer and make sure we choose Magi Video Renderer. Play with open. Sounds good. DTSX Master Audio. Woohoo! Let's go full screen. It looks the way it should be looking. I'm going to fast forward. I could actually adjust on the fly if need be. go make it a little brighter whatever I need to do all kinds of stuff I could do looks fantastic so just to underscore this is normally an HDR high dynamic range 4k ultra HD blu-ray running on my PC with DTSX running through my 1080p uh, projector so um, really happy really happy so, uh, so in summary, okay, so why, why do this, all right? Why do this, right? Well, in my opinion, okay, based on what I'm seeing, actually, let me rephrase this, okay? I mentioned that there's a 4K Blu-ray in this, but there's also a standard definition Blu-ray. What if I didn't have a Dolby Atmos? What if I just wanted to run Blu-ray? What happens is, when you run it with pot player with mad vr and you have that 4k hdr source material it looks better it looks better than the original sdr blu-ray that comes with it okay so you'll actually get a significantly better result with your pc doing the tone mapping and all the necessary conversions than what hollywood sent you in this box and that to me is very exciting. Uh, uh, you heard for yourself or you saw for yourself, Dolby Atmos and DTSX work. So fantastic, mission accomplished. And by the way, once you've got the, the Blu-ray imported into your PC as I described, you could try other players. You do not have to use Mad VR. Uh, VLC is another player. It has its own version of HDR to SDR uh, tone mapping. You could try it for yourself. 
for me, I, I liked what I what I saw with uh, Pot Player, but you may have your own experience. Okay, so so really exciting stuff. So I thank you for watching. We're going to talk again soon.